over there somewhere and smoking no. a pipe as you read no. a book. There's no. none of that. There's a, <laughs> there's a printer. There's a... Well, it is 10.02, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome and thank everyone on this call for joining our virtual meetings at work webinar. And a special thank you to our program partners, Turpin Communications. I am Marquita Robertson, the Executive Director of the Collaborative. The Collaborative's mission is to close the racial wealth gap in North Carolina by ensuring that everyone has a pathway to prosperity. Please note that this webinar is gonna be recorded and we'll have it online later on this week. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our webinar partners, Turpin. Well, thank you, Marquita, for that introduction. My name is Greg Owen Boger, and I'm the Vice President of Turpin Communication. And with me today, we've got Dale Ludwig, our founder and president. And the two of us are going to lead us through the next 90 minutes of trying to figure out how do we deal with virtual meetings at work, connecting with clients through technology. The other person we have on our side today is Sarah Stocker, and she is one of our communication coaches, and she's performing the role of host today. And if you don't know what that means, stick around because we're definitely going to be talking about that. And one of the things that she is doing for us is dropping a link to today's handout. It's available in the chat box. So if you want to go grab that, feel free. It'll also be made available to you after today's webinar. Now, if you don't know much about who Turpin Communication is, I'm going to give you a little bit of a baseline on our work. But before we do that, I want to recognize that we are all finding ourselves, even though we're three or three and a half, four months into this thing, we're, we're finding ourselves in a whole new world and we're doing all sorts of virtual meetings now that we never had to do before. So if you're feeling a little bit like this guy at the end of the day, you are in a good company. We're all feeling what's being called now Zoom fatigue. And it, we're we're learning that it's more challenging to communicate virtually and our brains are having to work more than they used to when we were able to be face to face with people. So our vision at Turpin Communication is a future where meetings, presentations, and training sessions are the least frustrating parts of doing business. And I'm guessing we are not meeting that vision right now because meetings are definitely frustrating. So our goal for you today is to give you the skills, insights, techniques that you can use to move your portion of your business forward effectively and efficiently during meetings. And everything that we talk about is absolutely going to apply to the virtual space, but it's also much of it will apply to the face-to-face -face situations that we will eventually get to have again. So when we're done today, my goal is that you're going to look a little bit more like this smiling guy than the guy that has, is exhausted and his head is pounding on his laptop. So a little bit of housekeeping. We are asking that you have your cameras on, please. And the reason for that is because it is so important important right now to make human connection. And although video is imperfect in helping us do that, it's one of the few tools we have. So go ahead, turn that camera on, uh, rollers and all, right? And we ask that you ask questions when they bubble up. We don't want you to, to wait until the end, although we will have Q&A at the end, but we want you to ask questions as they bubble up. You, if you're on video, you can just do this, give us a wave and Sarah will let me know that someone wants to talk. Uh, you can also take yourself off of mute and interrupt. You can also Greg, you are frozen. You are currently muted, which all of you are by default. You can press down the space bar when you're in Zoom, press down the space bar and and talk. It's sort of like the old walkie talkies where you would press the button to talk and then say over when you were done. The space bar will allow you to do that as well. I'm also going to ask that you reduce distractions, email, instant messaging. Um, be in this meeting with us today. One of the things we're going to talk about is that when we are in virtual meetings, we owe it to one another to be fully present. So get rid of the distractions that you can. And as those words are coming out of my mouth, I recognize that we have new coworkers that we're dealing with, and some of them have four legs. So there's not a lot we can do about those sometimes. 
Okay, from time to time, I will, and Dale, will pull back the curtain and explain to you one of the things that we're doing. So this is one of those moments. What I just did is I set expectations for how I want the next hour and 25 minutes to, to go. So if you find that the people that you are working with remotely are not meeting your expectations, it might be because they don't know what those expectations are. So get in front of that and, and let people know early on how you want the meeting to run and how you want people to interact with you. I also want to mention that this session is platform agnostic. And what I mean by that is we're working in Zoom, but you're probably working in other platforms, Skype, Microsoft Teams, uh, um, uh, Join Me, uh, any of the WebEx, any of those platforms. Most of what we talk about today is going to apply to those, all of those platforms. Now, one of the things you might be asking yourself is, okay, if Sarah is our host, why is she not on video? The explanation is really easy. She's busy, and she would look distracted to you if, uh, if she were on video. So we do usually recommend that the host not be on video. Okay, I said that I would talk a little bit about our work and why we are the lucky ones that get to talk with you today. So Turpin Communication is a communication training uh, company. We've been around for 28 years. I've been around for 25 of those. Dale, as I mentioned earlier, was our founder. And we work primarily with three uh, distinct types of communicators. So we provide presentation skills training, meeting and facilitation skills training, and training for trainers. And we do this virtually and in person. And when, you know, we've been a virtual company pretty much since the dawn of virtual time, if you will. And so we are no strangers to working virtually at all. And you know, when you do one thing for a really long time, sometimes you write books about it. And Dale and I have two books that are out right now, The Orderly Conversation and Effective Subject Matter Experts. Our third book, which is a companion piece to the orderly conversation called The Virtual Orderly Conversation. Um, I'm, well, I have it right here. Uh, just got the cover of it back from our designer, and that's going to be available on PDF on our website with, within days, probably. All right, some general themes from, the, from assessments that we've been hearing around the web, and this is applying to people at, you know, across the globe and at all levels of organizations. When we ask, what are you finding challenging? It comes into, uh, the challenges fall into three buckets. The first one is around technical comfort for you as a facilitator, and then how do you get other people comfortable as well? Now, obviously, we're going to be talking about technical stuff, and if there's something that we don't talk about, Google is your friend. But remember, Google it after the webinar, because I'm asking you to be in this meeting right now with us at 100%. Another bucket of challenges is around engaging participants. So how do I be engaged myself and how do I get others to engage with me? Using cameras is one of those things, uh, but we'll be talking about other tools. And then of course, efficiency and effectiveness and keeping things on track. And there are really two different Two, two different angles on the efficiency thing. First of all, it's how do you deal with the fact that you ask a question and all you get is silence? So how do I get people to engage with me and be uh, effective? The other thing is that thing where people talk over each other, like, eh, 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 no, you go, no, you go. Okay, all, and there's that, that thing, it just seems to be like endless. And then finally someone says, well, what I was about to say. So we'll, we'll talk about how do you manage that process as well. So what else might be bubbling up for you? I'm going to take us out of screen share and go to what's called gallery view in Zoom where those of us who are on video can, can see one another. Those of you who aren't on video, you, you can uh, drop thoughts into chat. But let me just open it up and don't forget to take yourself off mute. But what are the other challenges that you are facing right now in the work that you do? Oh, Jada, are you talking to us? Or are you talking to one of your coworkers? Because you're on, you're on mute if you're talking to us. Um, I was going to say I was on mute. <laughs> um, I was going to say that I think we were kind of learning it now, but like a challenge was just like getting people to start coming to the virtual one events and setting them up and getting people to like talk on them and make sure that it's relevant information that we're sharing. Okay. Yeah, it's easy to hide in the virtual space, much easier than in a live face-to-face. -face. Felicia. 
Yeah, for me, a lot of the trainings that we do um, require like exercises. Um, so like when we were together, um, you know, we can break people up in groups and that sort of thing. Um, and we're finding that we can still break people off in the virtual setting, but still just learning how to do that effectively. Um, that That is something that we're still working out, so. Yeah, it, it, it's not as simple as just saying, hey, here's a handout, go over there and, and, and I'll, I'll check on, on you in a little bit. It's, it's more complicated. And one of the things we definitely are going to be talking about is that preparation is way, 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 way more important in the virtual space. You can't rely on your old instincts so much. What other challenges are you facing? Uh, Dale says in chat, I'm a financial educator and a lot of my job was going to various organizations in the community for educational opportunities. That all stopped now. I'm having to figure out how to reconnect via Zoom. Yep. Well, uh, Dale, you're, you're uh, in the right space for learning that for sure. Add, Greg, that one of the issues that we have is having people to engage during our virtual, um, our virtual offerings, you know, similar set up as we have now, but then, but actually having people to talk and ask questions. If we're in person, you know, the questions flow freely, but in this, in this space, it's kind of hard to get people to engage at that level. It sure is. And we're, we're experiencing that right now. Uh, yeah, Michelle, it looked like you had something to say. I think it depends on the meeting and the type of group to know how to handle um, chat or questions. Um, I do um, a lot of stakeholder meetings where we do want feedback, but making sure people aren't talking over each other or not talking at all. It's hard to know, especially if it's the first time a particular group met in this format. I think that's challenging. I agree. And, and one of the things we'll talk about is the fact that we can no longer rely on our instincts to read people's facial expressions and body language. Uh, for example, when I was listening to you, Michelle, I was actually looking into the camera because I wanted to make you feel as if I was, was truly listening to you. But what I wanted to do was look at you because I want to read your facial expression. I want to see your body language. And, you know, in a regular conversation, you can see when somebody is about to speak up and, and, and you make way for the them to do that. That's just a natural part of communication, but we can't rely on those instincts anymore. We, so we have to learn how to use video in a way that replicates as best as possible that live face-to-face. -face. All right. Well, thank you for chiming in there. I'm going to go back to my screen. And let's move on. So Dale and I are going to be talking about best practices and your responsibility is to think about how they apply to the unique work that you do and whatever platform you happen to be using. So our uh, agenda looks like this. And we're going to start with engagement and video. Then we'll move to some guiding principles and Dale will deliver that content. Then we will we'll, uh, haul out that one page handout that Sarah gave you a link called the ground rules for effective meetings. And then time permitting, we will have some bonus material that you'll get to vote on. And my eyes are not landing on whoever talked about the, um, the breakout rooms, but going into breakout rooms is one of the options in the bonus material. So let's get at it so we have time to do that. So engagement and video. When we are engaged, we're able to think on our feet. So think back to the good old days when we used to be able to go out to dinner with family and friends. We would know when a conversation was going well because it felt good. And the conversation might loop-de-loop -loop and twist and turn and, and go off in rabbit holes and then come back. But we were able to manage that process because we were engaged in the process. So what does that mean? It means that we're here, we're now in this moment right here. We're self-aware and in control. We feel comfortable, not nervous, and we know instinctively what to do and say, just as in everyday conversation. So you know what it feels like to be engaged, and somehow we have to learn how to recreate that in the virtual space, but it's really, really hard to do. We have to be so, we have to work so much harder. We have to be on our toes, and so 
if we think back to the good old days, we recognize that there are two skills that we rely on instinctively, pausing and thinking, to formulate thoughts and connect to what has already been said. And then we use our eye contact to connect with people and observe, as I mentioned, the, the facial expression and the body language. The problem though, that is in the virtual space, eye contact isn't mutual. And I touched on this earlier, but it's worth going into because right now I'm looking into the camera's lens. I can't, I can't see your facial expressions. I can't see if one of you wants to speak. If I wanna observe you, and that's what it is, it's observing you, it's not, it's not even connecting so Marissa my eyes just landed on you and I'm, I'm seeing that you're smiling at me and that feels good but for you it looks like I'm staring off into space right it, because I have my my videos here on my second monitor now Marissa even if I were to pull your video into my primary laptop I'm still not looking at you or it doesn't feel as if I'm looking at you so we have to figure out what is the best balance between making a connection with people and then observing and the other weird layer of this is Patrice my eyes just landed on you I'm observing you as you're observing me it's almost as if we're like in this weird zoo or something right where it's it's, it's observation but it's not it's not connection and right now that connection is so important. So that is why we are recommending video when, whenever possible, because you know it's about making that human connection, expressing empathy toward one another. So that means we need to figure out how to do it well. And I've already mentioned that when you are speaking, you should be looking as much as possible into the video's lens because you want people to feel as if you're, you're connecting with them. Expect a little bit of a delay. Now, there isn't much delay in Zoom, not much at all. Uh, but some of the other platforms are, it's excruciating. We were, we were working with a group in, was that WebEx, Dale, the other day, the marketing company? And the lag was just, it was just excruciating. So you just have to get used yeah. to it. It was either that or, or go to, was it go to meeting? I don't know. I can't remember which but you're one right. was. It's not, it's, there's a huge difference between the platforms. Yeah, yeah. And you wanna think about remaining engaged the entire time, especially when you're listening to others. And I, I already mentioned that as well. So now, rather than relying on how it feels, we need to focus on how we're being perceived. And that feels so upside down, but that's the world we're in right now. So Dale, you wanna talk about this a little bit? Give, give everybody a break from listening to me drone on. Sure. The, and this is, um, this slide was created through my own breakthrough with using video. And I realized that what was uncomfortable for me was that I was talking to a group of people when I was by myself and I was using the level of energy that I would use if I were just talking to one person, if that makes sense. So you, as you can see on the title here, you want to work as hard as you do in a face-to-face -face setting when you are dealing with a group of people virtually. That means that you're, when, they, when you do that, then your, your vocal energy, facial expression, posture, gestures, all of those things improve because what used what I used to be doing on video was slouching back in my chair you know putting my head back not even thinking about how I was being perceived and mumbling and it just didn't it didn't work it didn't bring anybody into the conversation and it certainly didn't set the tone for the interaction so for me it became about all right this is a group you're talking to a lot of people you might be alone but there are a lot of people and you want to do what you can to to make it feel that way for them and for myself so that's what this one is about and it's not that you have to push for me, it's not about speaking louder or gesturing more. It's just about remembering the group. And then all of that other stuff happens naturally. Great. Yeah, and I think the facial expression is, is very important because when we are observing other people or when we are thinking, some of our, sometimes our faces will mm -hmm. uh, look not necessarily angry, but maybe disengaged. And so we have to keep our, our facial expression up. And I, by that, I don't mean smile more. I just mean, you know, keep your face nice and bright. Well, it's like yep. behaving as you do when you're in a meeting and you want to make a good impression. That's all. Well, that leads us perfectly into this next slide, oh, which okay. is thinking about our professional brand. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, so at Turpin Communication, we have a very specific brand and our clients have known, have, have become accustomed to how we show up in, in our training sessions, when we have meetings with them and so forth. And that doesn't change just because we are in the virtual space. So I like to think of it as my, my physical surroundings and 
and how I'm showing up on video is an extension of my professional brand. So let's talk about the technical considerations. So I've got an upgraded camera right here, which is sitting on a tripod. So the image that you're looking at is actually exactly what I'm looking at right here. And I have one of those ring lights that's just you know to the left of my camera. Now you may not have the capability for that. And I ordered a new camera Mm, three months ago and I'm still waiting for it. So you, <laughs> cameras aren't as available as, as they used to be. And I think about the rule of thirds, which is a photography rule. Put your eyes in the upper third. So you might want to adjust your camera. Now, many of you have a, oh, Kathy, I can see you adjusted your camera just a little bit. And it makes a big difference when you put the most interesting part of the image in the upper third. And when we're in video, the most interesting part is our eyes. Now, here is a picture of Lori Lightfoot. Uh, Dale and I are based in Chicago, and Lori is our amazing mayor. We love her. And she was on Trevor Noah's show a few weeks ago. And you can see that someone coached Lori to lift her laptop up to get her, you know, hopefully to get the camera at eye level. But I, after I saw this picture on, I think it was on Facebook, I thought, hmm, I'm going to go to YouTube. I'm going to see if I can find the video and see if she actually did it well. And mwah, mwah. She didn't quite have our eyes in, in the top third. And you can see nobody coached her to look into the camera either. So Trevor is getting it right and Lori, not so much. But we're going to give her an A plus for her ability to lead our city. So when you think about lighting, the general rule is you want more light in front of yourself than behind. And if you can put a side light uh, from, you know, like, a window or another lamp that will just add a little bit of contour and the image that you're looking at here is my old office when I used to get to go there. Now sound quality. Um, oh, I see actually my eyes just landed on William said zoom zoom sound is sometimes distorted. It sure is. And so one of the things you want to think about is what's the best option for me. And I used to say that an old fashioned landline was the best option. But as it turns out, my landline, and yes, I still have one, uh, is, a, is not my best option. My best option for me right now is dialing in through the computer's audio. So tinker, figure out what works best for the situation that you're in. And I think that people are more willing to put up with, with bad video than they are with bad audio. So, so really work on your audio. Now, here we have an image of six individuals in a meeting, and you can tell that some of them are engaged, or at least they look engaged, others not so much. So we're going to get out the annotation tool, and I'm going to give you a chance to uh, mark on these people's faces who you think is engaged and who you think is disengaged. So Sarah, can you help us out uh, pointing out where the annotation tool is? Sure. You're going to move your mouse to the top of your screen, and you're going to see a view options menu click on the arrow, and the third option down is annotate. When you select that, it's going to bring up a black toolbar at the top of your screen. And for this exercise, we're going to use the stamp tool, which is the fourth from the left. When you hover your mouse over that, you're going to see some different shape options you can choose, including that check mark or X. Click which one you want, and then click wherever you want to place it on the screen. And when you're all done, you can click that red X in the far right side to make that toolbar go away. Thank if you're you, on a mobile phone, you are looking for the pen icon at the bottom of your screen, and you'll have to um, handwrite the X or check mark with your finger and the marker tool. Yeah, so a red X for disengaged and a green check mark for engaged, but I see we've got some stars and hearts coming out. That's cool tool. Uh, use your creativity. But we want to mark up who do we think is engaged and who do we think is disengaged. Dale, we've got some controversy here. The poor lady in the lower left, the guy in the upper middle. We're pretty much in agreement though that the guy in the up, whoops, it's just as I say that someone put a red X on the, the guy in the upper right corner. So there is no right or wrong answer here. What I want you to take away from this part of the conversation is that the bottom line is that all of these people might actually be engaged and paying attention, but they don't necessarily look it. And so we really have to work hard because um, we owe it to the people that we're working with. Now let's take a look at the woman in the upper left here. I would probably say she looks disengaged. However, she might be taking notes. 
she might also be writing an email. So we just never quite know what, what people are up to. All right, that brings us to our next uh, agenda item, which is guiding principles. So Dale, I am going to turn things over to you. Well, unmute. Let me know how my volume is. I got a note from Sheila last time I was speaking where I was saying that I really was hard to hear. Is, it, is that better now? It's a little low. Um, Sarah, you probably have a better idea of of that. Yeah, I think it could be a little bit louder, I think, Dale, if you could project a little more. All right, I'll give it my best shot. But let me know if I get if I get quiet, because that's one of my issues in face-to-face in -face and obviously virtual. Okay, my job here is to spend a little bit of time talking on a really fundamental level about the guiding principles of the work that we do. Now it applies to face to face and it also applies to virtual. The big, the headline I guess is, is that the challenges that we face in, in just face to face interactions at business are more, are greater when we're dealing with the virtual environment. So as Greg said, this is one of the books, the first book that, that we wrote, and it's called The Orderly Conversation, Business Presentations Redefined. And I'm, I'm showing it to you now because what we found was is that a lot of people in business were approaching the process as if, uh, the, the presentation process, as if it were a speech, which is of course what we were all taught in school. If you, meant, if, if you took a public speaking class, those were speeches and they are not the same thing as a presentation. So that was the fundamental idea that, that we started off with. And if we look at this idea in a, this graphic way, we can see that the orderly conversation is, is both orderly and a conversation, and that there's a big arrow between the two indicating that there's a tension between those two characteristics. If we look at the orderly side, we can see that it's important in your meetings your training sessions to, to have a plan. You've got to prepare for them. As Greg said, in a virtual session, you need to prepare more. They need to be accurate. You need to worry about what you're talking about. And there needs to be some sort of structure that not only you think about, but that the people at the meeting are able to follow along with. Now, if you look at the other side, the conversation side, we can see that once your meetings start or once your presentation at a meeting starts, there's got to be engagement, spontaneity, and interactivity. So you, as we've already mentioned, it's really hard to get the conversation started in a virtual environment. It's hard to manage it once it does get started. So you've got to think about all the, all the potential issues that might come up and do your best to anticipate them. If we look at how the process works, the planning part is the orderly section of it, right? That, so you need to look ahead during the planning process to the uncertainties of the conversation. In the virtual environment, think about, okay, these people are gonna be reluctant to speak. They're gonna be on mute. What am I gonna to do to get this conversation started so that I can actually have the conversation that I wanna have? So actually planning for the interaction becomes part of the planning process there. And then once the meeting starts and things are flowing and the interaction is taking place, you're always adapting to what the plan was to what's happening in the moment, as you can see at the bottom of this slide. So it's not as if you plan it and then execute it, you plan it and then try to use that plan to sort of keep the process going forward. And it's fine, and I'm sure you all know this, if you get into a meeting and somebody asks you a question that's a little off track, let it go, let, you know, go off track, hey, help deal with that person in the moment. And in a virtual session, it just takes a little more forethought sometimes and a little more finesse to keep that going once the, once the conversation starts. What it also means, Greg has mentioned several times, how it feels is very different in the virtual environment, but how it feels in a face-to-face -face environment as well is important, which is why we talk about a default approach. If we go back to the previous slide and think about the order and the conversation, you are going to be more comfortable with one of those processes over the other, the planning process or the actual conversation process. So what we learned over the years, and we came up with this several years ago, was that people default to one side or the other. And as you can see here, we have writers and improvisers, and gender doesn't play a role here at all. But on the left-hand side, we have writers, their fundamental characteristic is that they thrive with organization and preparation, and that's a really good way to be. The downside for them, though, is that they can be inflexible and strict during delivery. So they might want to follow the, ex the agenda exactly the way it's planned during a meeting rather than loosen up a little bit and let the agenda be fl more flexible. On the other side, we have the improvisers. They have an opposite sort of perspective. Improvisers thrive with the connection to the people that they're talking to. So an improviser may not plan 
as much as a as an as a writer does because an improviser naturally thinks about the people that, that are going to be in that room and once the meeting starts they they think that they're able to manage it simply because they're very comfortable dealing with people now the downside for an improviser is that they can lose focus and be confusing during the meeting and i'm sure we've all been in meetings where an improviser lost control and it just went the meeting went all over the place and there was no there seemed to be no order at all and we've all been in meetings that were too strictly managed by somebody like a writer so it's not that there's anything wrong with either one of these defaults but understanding where you fall in the default thing is important because it helps you know what it's going to feel like to adapt. So an improviser is going to feel like, oh man, I, I really have to be more structured than I want and a writer needs to let it go a little bit. And we can talk more about this. The, the, this discussion could be part of the bonus material at the end of the webinar if you want to go into more detail. The second big idea I want to talk about is that it's important in every business situation to find your focus, be yourself, only better. This used to be our tagline. And it starts with, let's look in the middle of this first, be yourself. It's important that you are comfortable, that you are not nervous, that you're, you're thinking on your feet, as Greg has already mentioned. That's where you want to get to in all the meetings that you have. Virtually, that's, of course, more difficult to do. So that means the find your focus part will help get you there. Once you know what the issues are for you, to adapt to your default. To, for me, it's about speaking up a bit more, making sure my volume is where it needs to be. All of those things will help me get comfortable in the environment so that I can be only better on the right-hand side so that I can manage the whole process. But it always starts with being comfortably present, not worrying about the plan that you brought in too much, not worrying about the people that seem to be a little bit crabby too much, but it's a matter of being able to manage the whole process and be responsible for everything. It's very much, in a virtual session, it's much more about how willing you, how able you are to facilitate the conversation that takes place. And it's, it's for me, it feels a lot like when I'm teaching a class that might be a little bit reluctant might be a little tired from the night before or something like that and I've really got to work hard to bring them into it and to set the right tone. It's very much the same thing in a, in a virtual setting. And this slide that Greg had up a little bit ago is important now because the only better part falls into the, the the light brighten up your face, look like you're happy, really try to engage the camera as much as you can. That's That's part of the only better in a virtual environment. And then finally, my last slide is I want to talk about how we all succeed on two different levels. And I think this is an important consideration for virtual, especially. As you can see on the left-hand side, the first level is the plan. And then on the right, we have the second level, which is the process. Now, the plan is about getting the job that you can get in to do done. You want people to buy. You want them to agree to, with, to what you're recommending. You want them to align with your way of thinking of things. You want them to learn, especially with the audiences you're dealing with. You want them to learn and understand to be able to execute the recommendations that you're making. All of that is a very practical business goal. And the challenge is making sure that you achieve that goal through the conversation that you're having. So the second level here is about the process, about managing the conversation. You want to create the conditions for a fruitful discussion as best you can always difficult and it's always extra difficult in a virtual environment. Earn trust and goodwill, make it easy for folks, manage the give and take and nurture relationships. We were talking before the webinar started about trust and how important it is to when you're working with a client or when you're working with someone that you want that you want to help and you're you're offering them your services, they must trust you before they'll take them. And creating that sort of trust is really, really important at every meeting or every presentation that you do. In a virtual environment, it takes a different set of skills and which we'll be talking about you know, as the webinar goes forward. But I think some of these, last thing I wanna point out is that some of these are just very practical in the moment, things like making it easy, making sure people have the information they need, making sure your slides, if you're using slides are understandable, are clear, being willing to back up if that's what they need you to do, if they missed something, if there's a technical issue, fixing that. And then there's some very large issues like earning trust and goodwill. So it's an iterative process sometimes. If you meet with people several times, it, gradually the trust is built up. That's important to remember. But it's about not just the focus, not just that first level. It's about how you manage the interaction itself. Okay, Greg. Yeah, and I think of it as uh, 
you want to be the type of communicator that other people want to work with and you build up that uh, that that credibility and that trust over time and so it's about showing up consistently over and over and over so that one, that's again another thing that makes this a more challenging environment so let's talk about ground rules for effective meetings shall we this is the document that uh, Sarah put a link to is just a one pager if you want to download that or if you have a printer handy that's cool too we'll also make sure that you have access to that this tool uh, once the the webinar is over what I want to point oops I just clicked that link we don't want that there we go. What we're going to do is we're going to treat this document as another layer of our agenda. So in other words, we're going to start at the top and we're going to work our way down. And one of the things you might be thinking right now is, hmm, there are two columns. What's up with that? So there are two groups of people in any meeting. There's the lead facilitator or facilitators, and there are the attendees. And we all have a shared responsibility, a shared commitment to one another to getting whatever that work is done. And I want to tell a, a very quick story about how this tool came into being. This was several years ago. One of our clients called us up and said, hey, I've got a problem, and it's an expensive problem, and I'm hoping you can help me fix it. So uh, the backstory here is that she is the head of marketing for a very, very well-known, well-established, ancient companies, and there are dozens of iconic brands that she manages. And if you know anything about marketing, you know that there are multiple different, very expensive marketing agencies that come together to work on any particular marketing project. So what she was doing, her name is Sue, what Sue was doing was she was bringing all of these agency representatives and her entire marketing department into one room for a full day. And she did this regularly, almost quarterly, if I recall. And she said, the problem is that these these consultants are coming in they're sharing their ideas and then they're sitting back and not paying any attention to anybody else's ideas and she says i need them all to collaborate i need them to work together in order to make our brands the, be the best that they can be and these meetings are super expensive and they're not meeting my expectations and it, it occurred to me when we were working with her is that everybody has been through some form of training about how to present or how to facilitate or how to train, but we've never learned, even back in school, we never learned how to just simply be a participant in somebody else's meeting. So I thought, huh, we're onto something here. So let's, let's roll out some training and teach people actually how to do it. So we did with this group of people and it was amazing. They actually did participate now that they knew what the expectations were. So this tool might be something if you're finding that people aren't, um, aren't participating fully with you, this tool might help you. So let's get at it. Now, let me ask you a rhetorical question here. Do you ever get the sense that others aren't participating fully in your meetings and what are they doing to give you that impression? So take a couple moments and drop into chat for us just what you're observing that makes you feel like others are not fully engaged with you and paying attention and participating. Marissa says camera's off. Yep, it's so easy to hide without the camera. Um, not answering questions. No feedback, talking to other people, looking away. I have to ask questions directly, directed specifically to one person in order to get them the answer. Yes, we're going to talk about that. Not asking questions, lack of response. Oh, they're coming in so fast I can't read them. Um, they might be on their phone or their laptops, no feedback. Getting up and leaving the room. You wouldn't do that in a live face-to-face -face situation probably, but people do it in the virtual space. They're on a different telephone, looking around the office with their head down, yeah, all of those things. Um, all of those things are, are happening. So we owe it to one another to, to the best that we can not do that, knowing full well that sometimes children and spouses and four-leggeds, you know, uh, also walk into the picture and we have to deal with them and uh, at the same time. So let's agree that positive meeting culture requires full participation from both groups. And remember, this is part of your job and part of your folks' job as well. So let me ask you this. How many of you are managers of people? Doesn't look like we have any managers in the room, pretty much uh, individual contributors. OK. Oh, uh, Lisa says she is, Monica says yes. Okay, so for those of you who are managing people or even managing clients externally, you might have to help them understand how to participate. 
All right. Virtual tools are, are some of the things that we can use to get people to participate. But the more virtual tools you have, it's the more it's like a circus and you've got some spinning plates and it's a lot to deal with. So recognize that virtual tools, if you decide to use them, plan how you're going to do it in advance and figure out where they're located and how to tell other people where to find them. And recognize that on the fly, you can use them or not. So you can make those decisions. Remember Dale talked about the orderly conversation. During the conversation, you are a adapting what was planned to what's happening in the moment, abandoning tools for maybe time management or just because people don't seem to want to use them, that is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. So virtual tools are generally more necessary the more formal your meeting is or the more people involved. And you should always mm -hmm. consider having someone take the role of host if you are using the tools. So let's talk about hosting now. It's a partnership. Uh, Sarah is very much a, a member, a, a very important member of this partnership of the three of us delivering this content because Dale and I are a little bit like the Wizard of Oz, right? We can't do it. We can't do it all. So we need help. So what are we doing? Well, Dale and I are focusing on engaging you, um, delivering our content, and making sure that we are reaching the goal of the meeting. While Sarah in the background is our second pair of eyes, ears, and hands, she's managing technology, handling problems, monitoring chat, hand raising, those sorts of things. And it's very likely that Sarah is doing stuff in the background that we're not even aware of. Uh, for example, one of you may have had a technical issue and you privately chatted with with Sarah and then she's helping you with that that happens all the time so one of the questions you might be asking yourself now is do I always need a host and no not necessarily if you're only working with one person or it's a mundane staff meeting or something like that a host isn't necessary but when the stakes are high when there are more people involved probably you'll want to take uh, ask someone to host for you and then for those of you who are managers, think about building the capability of your team members because like Dorothy here, it's, you know, it's, it's a team effort. And it's likely that even when we get to go back into uh, office spaces again, it's not going to be 100%. And so virtual meetings are going to, I mean, they're here to stay. They were here to stay a long time ago, but they're just now, they're, they're not going away. So you can rotate responsibility. You know, maybe you have a staff meeting or something like that where you ask somebody to, to manage the technology. Um, or you could share responsibility. You know, Dale and I could be going back and forth, but we choose to have a dedicated host. And the reality is, though, that, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, which means some people on our teams very likely will become ill. So just make sure that you've got your bases covered. We've already established it, but preparation is absolutely critical. So you have to agree that you need to solidify the plan, set expectations, and make sure you select the appropriate attendees too. And then on the attendee side, make sure that you have your calendar cleared and your headspace cleared so that you can participate fully as well. So that brings us to the preparation continuum. Now, this is after content has been created, slides, agenda, whatever, whatever it is that you're sharing visually. Then you have to figure out what's the degree of formality and what do I need to do to get myself prepared? So on the informal side, you can just wing it. That's perfectly reasonable with a, a team meeting. Or if you're doing something more formal, like what we're doing, a dry run might be uh, more appropriate. So for this 90-minute webinar, we've been doing this uh, I think since the last week of March. So back then, getting ready to deliver these things, we got into a dry run situation and it took us four hours to slog through this content. So we were working with each other going, okay, how deep should I go? How, how shallow should we stay? Is it all in the right order? What are the threads that need, need to be uh, woven through? Are we doing that appropriately? Are we connecting dots? And then Sarah and Kevin, one of our other team members, they were working with us on well, Greg, you've been talking for too long, so we need to get Dale to get his voice in here because even that can help um, improve people's focus. Uh, they were talking about tools, like maybe we should chat here or annotate or maybe a whiteboard would be a good solution here. So you're just working through all of that. And the other thing you're figuring out is, okay, I'm a host right now, so my toolbar looks a little bit different from everybody else's. So if we're going to, to drag out the whiteboard, what do I need to say to people who maybe don't know what a whiteboard is to get them to participate? So you're working through all of that stuff. 
the, the time to work through that stuff is before the meeting starts. So just a quick show of hands, how many of you are doing what you would consider more formal situations? And those of you who are not on video, you can raise your hand in the participant pod. So it looks like maybe half of our group is doing more formal stuff. Are you finding yourself doing dry runs? Yeah, okay, good, 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 good. So the dry run is over. Now it's time to actually hold the meeting. So as a facilitator, arrive early. Our standard practice at Turpin Communication for formal stuff is we always arrive 30 minutes in advance just to make sure our heads are clear, um, we've got the right tools squared away and, uh, and, and so forth. Now, if you're just doing a regular staff meeting, that's not necessary. Just log in a few minutes early. And the other thing, as we've mentioned at, at the bottom of the slide, is dealing with children, spouses, and pets who are our new coworkers. Oh, I, I, th th a thought just popped into my head the other day, and I thought this was brilliant. One of our, one of our uh, participants in a training class said that she has taught her four-year-old daughter that when mommy's headset is on, you cannot interrupt me at all. When mommy's headset is off, you're more than welcome to, to interrupt me. I thought that was a really great uh, coaching tool for, for a four-year-old. Now, as an attendee, you should also be arriving early to clear your head, get settled in, and engage with others. And when you do that, it, it shows respect and it also keeps things efficient. So you want to greet people as they arrive. Um, use that, that greeting time purposefully and check in with the team members. How are you doing? Because that's the time that, that you can show your human side, you can express empathy for whatever happens to be going on. And, uh, and you would do that in a live face-to-face -face situation anyway. So just try to recreate that, that informal chit chat. And when you do, it, it helps you establish that trust that we had talked about earlier. Now, Dale talked about it as uh, doing what you can to create the conditions for a fruitful discussion. It was this graphic that he showed you earlier. Now, let's say that we were in that informal chit chat. Now you have to formalize it. So here is a tool, and we're gonna give you access to this uh, after the webinar is over, but um, it's a tool to help you formalize everything. And we call it framing the conversation. And you can think of it as the introduction. It's where you uh, take responsibility for setting direction, purpose, context, and giving people a reason to participate. And if you've ever sat in somebody else's meeting and you're like, where is this thing going? Or why was I invited? Why am I here? It's because the leader of that event didn't do everything they could to frame the conversation appropriately. So here we have an image. Can I, can I interrupt for just Absolutely. a second? Absolutely. Rob has a question that I think might be relevant for right now. Okay. Can you see it? I can't. Thinking of Zoom fatigue, do you have recommendations for limits on individual meeting time and numbers of meetings per day? For managers and leaders, we need to allow time for work to still get done outside of meetings. Boy, is that true. So that was my comment at the end. So do you, what do you, do you want to take that? that? I think that the, we get this question a lot and about what's, what's the ideal length of time and what we always say is no, certainly no more than two hours for a meeting because that's that's really pushing it. And so that means you might have to have shorter meetings, more frequent shorter meetings and try not to schedule yourself back to back in meetings, which is what, because I think one of, I can't remember which client it was, but they, they the, from, from high above in the organization, they were like, okay, if you want to have an hour meeting, schedule it for 50 minutes so that people have 10 minutes to get to the next one if they have another one right after this one, just to build in some sort of time to, to catch up, even if it's just to, you know, run to the kitchen. But it's, but meetings need to be shorter and because they are much more difficult to participate in. And so that, so that means either more efficient than they usually are or spread out, broken down, spread out. And of course, as Greg was just saying, think about who's invited to the meeting too. Are you, are the people that are there, the ones that are absolutely necessary for the meeting? Greg, what do you want to add to that? I want to add that you said shorter meetings and I, I'm going to add, I'm not arguing with you. It's, okay. but it's another, it's another thing to consider that I think it just takes longer to get business done in the virtual space. So let's right. say you, you typically have a 30 minute 
team check-in, maybe that 30 minute check-in should be more like 50 minutes so that you have the time to get the work done. And then you've got that 10 minutes to get into the next thing. So um, there isn't a perfect answer, but there are options for you. Um, and the other thing I want to mention, Sarah, I'm not sure what's going on, but I was not able to see in chat that that question. So um, if I don't see it either, I'm guessing I'm guessing it went to Dale privately. Because uh, I don't see it either. Okay, sorry about that. I did not <clears throat> notice the little privately parentheses there. So my fault. Okay. Disaster averted. I was afraid that our chat function was was falling apart. No, it's me not paying attention. Hey, Rob, you don't have to apologize for that at all. Um, that we're all doing stuff like that. Now, I will say, though, that be really careful about the private chat, because um, if you're if you mean for it to go private and you accidentally send it to everybody, that can be a real um, that can be a real downer, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> I have a secondary channel open because we use Slack and we have the Slack channel open. So if I want to talk to Sarah indirectly, so that there's no way I can mess it up because if anybody's going to, it's going to be me. Um, we use Slack. We do it that way. Yeah. So, while, we're, while we're talking about this, another best practice that uh, is we don't, it's not formalized in this webinar, but uh, we should probably talk about it, is that if you are finding that you're having a really hard time reading people's body language and facial expression, and if you have a partner, you might, in, the, in, a, in a high stakes situation, you might ask a partner to come into the meeting for you, and that person's resp key responsibility is to read facial expression, and then in a third uh, party app, application like Slack or, or Skype or something, right. they can be communicating with you, hey, somebody looks frustrated or somebody looks like they might have something to say or you're getting really positive feedback here. You know, that's, that's important stuff. So if the stakes are high, that might be something that you want to consider. And it's really, and it's similar to the host role because I know one of the things that, that I don't know if we've talked about it yet, but since we cannot, since I cannot see any of, any of your tiles, video tiles when I'm looking into the camera, if some of if somebody were to raise her hand or his hand in this, I would rely on Sarah to say, "There's a question. Stop." It, just as I did with Greg a second ago. So you really, it's much more of a, it's much more of a planned sort of interaction and, and give and take that happens. Yeah, someone's asking, "What is Slack?" Uh, Slack is a communication tool that allows you, us as a team to communicate. Um, it's sort of like text. Sarah, can you explain it? Instant messaging. That's I, I what would I call, yeah, I'd call it instant messaging platform that yeah. you can use to communicate in teams or individually. Yeah, so we use it um, just to get quick answers out of people. Hey, uh, are, are you available for a quick phone call? Or um, the restaurant downstairs, or it used to be, you know, the, the restaurant over in town is having a special on, you know, whatever today. We can, we can share that right. information very quickly with one another. And it's really efficient because you can set up, well, we have several channels, like there's one that's Greg, Sarah, me. There's one that's just Greg and me. And so it, it's a, it's very easy. It's much faster than email because you can just shoot, fire it off. And is there a free version of Slack? Actually, there that's is. what we use, yeah. believe it or not. Oh, that we is what we free, use. It's free. I don't yeah. know how they make money, but anyway. Yeah, and Felicia is asking, is it better than text? I would say for business, yes, because it also will keep a record. I mean, not indefinitely, but for going a, while, a way back. So sometimes, you know, Greg will answer a question for me on Tuesday, and I go back and look at it on Thursday when I'm actually doing the work or that kind of thing. So right. I, I do it, like it for, for that. Yeah. It's great. It's And it's on your laptop, or it's on your phone if, as well if you want. But. Yeah, I mentioned earlier that there were times when I'm going to stop and pull the curtain back and, and I'm going to do that for what just happened here. So um, as you can see, my slide is showing that I want to talk about the framing strategy, but there was the, the question that came in, which I love. Dale interrupted me and then the conversation took on a completely different, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it completely went in a, in, in a 
different direction. Out, in a different direction, yeah. And that's perfectly fine. There's really good stuff that can happen when, when that happens. So allow it to happen, but then at some point you need to take control back. So watch me take control back and get us refocused on the framing strategy. So what we have here is what appears like four sticky notes. And I wanna show you how to frame up a very mundane team meeting. So I might start the meeting by saying, hey everybody, I wanna recognize that the process that I have been forcing on you is causing a lot of frustration. So my goal for today is to roll out a new process. And I thought we would start with what's not working. And I wanna show you an app that I found over the weekend that I think will be a good solution. And I wanna roll out some new features or at least point them out to you. And then we can set some next steps for fixing this thing. The reason we're doing this is because I really would like less frustration and a quicker turnaround. So there, I was able to formalize our conversation very easily, but, and by using these four pieces, I'm able to provide you with direction, purpose, context, and a reason to participate with me. Assume they are distracted, right? We've been talking about how people are distracted. Well, as the leader of the, of the uh, meeting, assume that they are, and you need to work hard to refocus them. This is a tool that allows you to do that. Now here is a second example. Let's say that we are all on the same team and I'm your manager. I might start the mundane staff meeting by saying, good morning, everybody. I wanna recognize that there's a lot going on right now. So our goal as always with our staff meetings is to get everybody on the same page. So the agenda is the same as it always used to be. We'll do that round robin. The only difference this time is that I will call on your name when it's your turn so we can avoid that talking over each other thing that happens. And then I need to roll out a new yet another work from home policy. The reason we're doing this is it's just really critical that we know what's on everybody else's plate. So there, again, direction, purpose, context, and a reason to participate. Now, let's give you a crack at this. So in chat, tell us what kinds of meetings are you currently leading, whether it's internal or external? While they're chatting, Greg, Susan typed into um, the chat, where and how do you get these great graphics like the start that appears? It is so effective. Um, it's in PowerPoint. It's just you, um, we'll talk about animation, but it's really in the virtual space, using animation is one way to get people's attention. And it's, it's super easy. Later, just Google animation in PowerPoint and you'll be able to, you'll be able to um, learn how to do it. Oh, and she said the star, the call outs, using a call out is what she was referring to. Right. It's, it's called a call out. Yep. Yeah. Um, by just adding, uh, uh, what do they call it? Shapes, I think, is as simple as that. Yeah. Okay. You are telling me what kind of meetings you're having. A parenting class, um, external, internal evaluations, trainings, weekly marketing, partner meetings, virtual HBE showing new devices, equipment, board meetings, teaching, staff meetings, customer meetings, outreach, divisional meeting, okay. Scholarship interview with graduating seniors, wow, okay. Let's do, oh, my eyes aren't landing on it now that, there was one in here I thought, oh, that would, that would be, make sense. Don't you hate that when your eyes land on something and then all of a sudden it won't, you can't find it again. Tammy, where are you on the, are you on video, Tammy? I am not seeing you. Sarah, can you help me out? Is, is, Tammy, no, she's Tammy not. Tammy is not on video. No. That is perfectly fine. Tammy, do you mind if I use your example here, the um, the showing new devices and equipment? Would that be okay? You're on mute, Tammy. Let me let's see if I, it's not letting me unmute you. Sure, that. Oops. Did you say that would be okay? <laughs> Yes, that would be fine. Okay, cool. So Tammy, in, in, this, um, in, in this sort of meeting where you're showing different devices and equipment, what would be the audience's current situation? Like, do they not know how to use that equipment? 
Yes, it's a situation where it might be a new device that could help them to do something and they don't even know the device exists. And so it's a completely show them, um, it could be an app on a, on a phone or a tablet, but it also could be oh, like a different type of keyboard or a different type of mouse or um, something like that. Okay, so the goal is just to show them how to, how to use it. So what might be on the agenda then? Um, maybe a, a, a virtual tour, tour of the app? Right. As well as like features that might be important for them individually. And then what else might you talk about? How to, how to, how to buy the tool or how to get right. access to it? how to get access to it and then also when they would use it would they use it in classroom would they use it in their work environment would they use it in their home environment okay let's say it's an app just so we can get a little bit of clarity there so once they take your advice and use the app what's the benefit to them like maybe efficiency Yes, it could be efficiency. It could be um, like an app that would help them take notes in their classroom in, in a classroom setting. Okay. Okay, you all just witnessed the terror it is when you have to type in front of somebody else, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, if, if you like this, I'm going to model this for you, Tammy. If, if you like this, Sarah is going to take a screen grab of it and she'll drop it into chat so you have access to it so you don't have to recreate this later on if you like it. So I might start out this meeting like this. Well, thanks for joining me for today. I wanted to show you this, this new device. It's an app, and I, and I don't think you know about it because I just learned about it. So my goal is just to show you how to use it. And I'll give you a virtual tour and then show you some features that I think might be important to you. Then we'll talk about how we can get, ac get you access to it and then when and where to use it. The reason I wanted to talk about this today is I think it can help you be more efficient and help you uh, in the classroom. So there, I was able to formalize the conversation, provide us with direction, purpose, context, and a reason to participate. So Tammy, what are your thoughts about that? You made that look easy. <laughs> you know why? With two reasons. I do this all the time. And I don't know anything about your topic, right? So my brain isn't cluttered and I, I don't even have the inclination to go into more detail. So. That leads me now to when you frame up a conversation, you want to be able to keep it very, very high level. So Sarah, were you able to get a screen grab of that? Yes, uploading Excellent. it now. Thank you so very much. And as Dale has talked about already, but you know, you want to be able to provide relevance and efficiency in your meetings and this tool is one way to do it. And as I mentioned, we will make sure that you get access to these tools after the webinar is over. So Jada, one of the things we'll want to figure out is how do we get this, how do we get these tools to everybody? Okay, so you formalize the conversation. Now you have done it well, there are, therefore people are going to participate. You've, you've earned their participation, which then means that you need to listen and be present and everybody else needs to do the same. So now the conversation is going, now we need to figure out how to deal with it. So our guy here on our seesaw is keeping the conversation focused and fruitful. He's doing two things simultaneously. He is controlling the situation, controlling the message, while simultaneously encouraging participation. But it's not as if the seesaw should always be level. There are times when you need to exert more pressure to get people to incur, uh, encourage them to participate or to take control, like I did earlier, uh, to make sure that you can stay on track. So let's talk about ways to do this. And one of the things to recognize is that you might need to teach them how to use the tools and you need to take responsibility for that. Now the tools that are in most of these platforms can help you encourage participation. And remember, when you switch things up, it improves focus 
for them. You, you probably have noticed that when Dale speaks, it improves focus, it brings you back. Or when I ask you to haul out the stamping annotation tool, it improves focus. One of the ways we do it here at Turpin Communication is we have multiple speakers and we share documents and share screens. So in our, in our monthly sales meeting, there are five of us that are in the meeting and three of us have responsibility for sharing information for everybody else. So just the simple Now, the Greg, you are frozen. Can you hear me? This thing back on track. I might say, hey, everybody, I love what you are talking about right now. Uh oh, I'm getting a notification that my internet is unstable. Can you hear me okay? You can, okay. So, um, so I need to take control back. So I might say, folks, I love this conversation. What I want you to do for me is type into chat the most important thing that you want me to take away from this conversation. So I'll give you a few seconds to type into chat, chat. And now I've brought the conversation back and I can move it forward again. And the great thing is because I have toggled on this option in Zoom, the chat function is saved and um, sent to me immediately following the meeting. So it's a record. It's the same thing as uh, roll, uh, writing on a, a flip chart, rolling it up, sticking it in your suitcase, and taking it home after the meeting. Now, breakouts, so that was something that was mentioned earlier. And it's in the bonus material. So if you want to experience breakouts and how you can use those to your advantage, we certainly can do that. Now. This notion of encouraged control, you probably have a preference and you may not even recognize that you do. So, and when you have a preference for something, it might lead to unintended consequences. So, Odell just says my connection is in and out, so he's gonna go off video. That's a best practice. If you find that there's just too much data running through your internet connection, take away the thing that's heaviest, which is the video. So if you encourage too much, you might unintentionally ask too many questions, use too many virtual tools, get off track, let discussions go too long, run out of time, you get the idea. On the other hand, if you control too much, you might talk more than you listen, stifle discussions, interrupt, skim the surface, or ignore an individual. So you wanna put that in check. So let's annotate. We're gonna get out that annotation tool. This time it's going to be the text tool. So Type your name on our uh, graphic here. Do you think that you tend to control? Do you tend to encourage? Or do you think you get it pretty much just right? So put your name on one side or the other of our teeter-totter, our seesaw, or right on top of his head in the middle. Carrie says Again, she, that annotation tools at the top of your screen, view options, annotate, and now you're using the text tool to type. Oh, we've got a bunch of controllers in the Zoom room today, don't we? One of the things I can do as a host is I can move. So it looks like, Tammy, you put your name right on the word control, so I can move that over here. And it looks like we've got a couple people unintentionally typing over each other. So I can move people around. Paul put himself right inside the bowl. Good job, Paul. <laughs> Susie, great point. It depends on my audience. Yes, it's always going to be situational. Always. Okay, so the point of really any time you, you think critically about your own performance is what, what might be the unintended consequences of how I typically work? So thank you for sharing that with me. And Sarah, if we can clear the board, that'd be swell. And if you want to take a deeper dive into facilitating discussions, we certainly can do that. So wrapping up this conversation around the tools, use them judiciously. You know, some people might say to you, hey, um, you have to keep things lively. So use, use a tool every three to six minutes. Be careful of that, because if you use tools um, without purpose behind them, it can feel condescending to people. 
And we don't want that. We want mutual respect. So recognize when people are chiming into the conversation, this means you need to be listening, express patience, connect dots for them, build off what's come before, probe, check in. And you probably do this naturally face to face because you've been doing it for a while. You're, you're pros at this. In the virtual space, you just have to be on your toes even more. And then follow up, making sure that at the end of the meeting, you wrap everything up, make sure that you are identifying what the next steps are, who's responsible for them, and getting mutual agreement. All right. If you want to use this tool with your teams, you are more than welcome. And we can also customize it to you. Some of our clients are asking us, you know, our, our meeting culture is different from the can you customize this tool and then co-brand it? Yes, we can do that for you. We can also provide trading like this for you and your team if you are interested in that. So that brings us to our bonus material. We have about, what, 17 or 18 minutes. We have plenty of time here. Uh, Sarah, can you clear the screen for me? There's uh, Helen has um, unintentionally, I'm sure, written on that. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so the bonus material looks like this. There are four options and we'll have time for two. So we can take a deeper dive into facilitating discussions. We can take a deeper dive into strengths and weaknesses. That was that default approach thing, writer improviser that Dale talked us through. I can also talk about visual aids. Now this would be going more into formal presentations or webinar mode, or we can go into breakout rooms. So as we've mentioned, we live in Chicago, Illinois is where we are based and in, in Illinois, every Everybody gets the chance to vote early and often. So we will give you two votes in our poll. Go ahead and vote for two of these options. And because I am a host here, I can see what percentage of us have actually voted. So let's see if we can hit 100%. We're up to 54%. Come on, people, exercise your right to vote. We're at 69, 71, 73. Oh, man. Are we not even going to hit 75%? Well, all right. So that may be an indication that some people have walked away. Oh, now we're at 78%. All right. Go ahead and close the, the poll, Sarah, if you will, and share the results. All right, it looks like we are doing visual aids and breakout rooms, so let's get at it. Let's go to visual aids first. So, oops, it looks like we've got more X's. Uh, Sarah, if you could clear the screen, that would be much appreciated. So this graphic here is showing us three different types of visual aids. So let's focus on the one in the middle first. So this is a very traditional visual aid. It's a picture, it's meant to communicate quickly. A lot of times people will say, people who know a lot about presentations and PowerPoint, they would say, you always use pictures and pictures are better, always better than words. And I'm like, eh, let's put that in check. Let's, let's make sure that we're, we're pragmatists and let's do what it makes sense to get the job done. So let's focus on the left-hand side. This is a slide similar to what I delivered earlier when we were talking about engagement. And it's notes. It's a reference for, the, for me as the presenter. I don't need to memorize what's on that slide. I can look at it while I'm presenting, and I should be looking at it because uh, you want to pull the slide into the conversation. The, the slides aren't a secondary mode of communication. They, they are part of the primary mode. Of conversation. Now also, sometimes you have documents. We had a document today, right? And we just worked all the way through. So if you do uh, use visual aids that look more like documents, make sure in the good old, like in the good old days, to have a hard copy. And if they can't have a hard copy, maybe send it in advance or let pe give people time to print it out or at least download it and have it handy so that they can read it and study it. Now, Dale, um, why don't you take over because I've been talking for long enough. Okay, let me try. Let's see what happens if I turn my video back on again. Okay. 
I might freeze up and go away, but I'll try. Okay. It's just one slide. So the, the idea here is to make, as Greg just said, to make sure that the slides are part of the conversation that you're having. And in a virtual environment, it's very easy for folks to focus just on the, the video of you or just stare at the screen with the slide on it. So you want to bring them into the conversation. And the first point I want to mention here is you want to talk about what they are and what they, as well as what they mean. So if we had, let's say a really traditional like pie chart or something like that, you'd want to tell people, all right, we have a pie chart here divided into four parts. The four parts are this, and I want to fo focus just on one of the pieces of the pie. You haven't talked about what the pie chart means at all yet. You've simply oriented people to what they are seeing on the screen. Now in a virtual environment where people make their attention to be wandering anywhere. If you can't see them on video, you have no idea what, what might be going on. So that means you need to work a little bit harder to bring them into that slide and say, all right, can you, you've heard Greg say today, let's look at this, let's prepare, focus our attention on here, it looks like that. That's the, the idea of this. Second bullet point here has to do with Thank you, Greg. With starting with the slide title, Greg's going to talk about this more in a, in a bit. But if you make sure your slide titles are meaningful, it'll do a couple of things. One, it'll help the people looking at the slide figure out what it means very quickly. And it also will help you set the slide up. Because if you start with the slide title and the slide title has a it communicates maybe just exactly what the slide means or maybe just what it is, it'll help you remember to, to bring it into the conversation smoothly. Moving along. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we're getting a note that it's a little hard to hear you, so. All right, let me try this. I don't think it's an internet connection thing. I think it's a volume thing. Yeah, I, there's something up here because I'm, anyway, I will do it. Start with the slide title. All right, move on, Greg, to the next bullet. No, oh, sure. You wanna control where people look. And this is about using directional language when necessary. So if there's a part of the slide that you really want them to focus on, be sure to tell them where to focus. Lower left-hand corner, upper right-hand corner, left side, right side, all of those things help people direct their focus where it needs to go. And that is a tough thing to remember when you're delivering a slide, especially one that you're really familiar with. But try to do that anyway. You're sort of guiding people along as if they're on a, you're the tour guide and the slide is what's being toured. And you can all, always stop sharing and use gallery view. We've been using this all, all morning long. When the slide is no longer relevant to the conversation, stop sharing the screen, go to gallery view. Well, at least it's called gallery view in Zoom, where the, where the videos are all tiled on the screen and we can see each other. And then bring, when it's time to bring focus back to the screen, to the slide, do that, bring it up, and it'll help you get people back on track with that as well. So it's all about thinking about when you want the slide in there, where you want them to look, and if you don't need it, get rid of it because it'll just be a distraction. And if you want, it, maybe, maybe it'll open up the conversation a bit more if everybody is is tiled on video. Yeah, thank you, Dale, for giving me a, a breather. Um, let's let's talk a little bit more detail about how to orient people to the slide, and we do that through crafting useful slide titles. So here is a lousy slide title, gross sales. It doesn't do anything to help me. Let's say that I'm nervous or distracted or, or just, just you know, maybe I prepared the slide deck two days ago and I, I didn't really look at it again. Gross sales doesn't tee up a specific conversation. So watch the screen. I'm going to improve the slide title month over month sales growth. See, that tees up a very specific story. So don't go general on our generic on the slide title, get very specific. Now, let's also say that maybe, maybe the bump or maybe the, the thing that I want to focus people on is the bump between April and May. Maybe there was a marketing thing that happened uh, that I want to talk about because it shows that it actually worked. I might put a circle around that or an arrow or something like that. Now, Dale said to uh, orient people to what they're looking at. So let me model how I can deliver this slide by relying on my slide title and then showing you what you're looking at. Well, here you can see a bar chart showing us month over month sales growth. You can see we've got January through October and every month progresses higher and higher. So there I have just oriented you to what you're looking at and then I can go into whatever detail I want to at that point, but work really hard to orient yourself and your listeners. Now bullets. We can't escape them, so we need to figure out how to deal with them. So when a list of bullets comes up, what you're doing as a listener is you're wondering two things. Should I read or should I listen? 
the speaker is wondering three things. Should I read this? Should I say something else? Or should I ignore the bullets? And the answer is you should read this. And you've probably heard, don't read your slides. That rule came from a good place, which was people were reading entire sentences and entire paragraphs. But if you trim down your bullets, so they're just a few words, then what you're doing is using the same language that's on the slide and you're not making people work too hard to figure out um, why are you using different language. So once the bullets come up, you can read the entire list, then go back into detail. You can go into detail one at a time, or you can animate to control focus. And we are always going to encourage animating in the virtual space, because again, it does a little bit to get people's attention back on you. Using directional and descriptive language, Dale mentioned this, but we are always using phrases like in the upper left corner, the blue box, the red graph, those sorts of things, because you're like a tour guide showing people where to look. If if you've ever been on an architectural uh, tour or anything like that, you the, the, the tour guides work so hard to make sure that you're focused where they want you to. It's the same thing. Okay, it was breakout rooms, uh, which was the second one, right, Sarah? Correct. Okay, so let's go into breakout rooms. What we're going to do here, oops, ha, huh, well, sh doggone it. <laughs> I went the wrong way. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to send you into random breakout rooms and Sarah is going to be setting that up right now. I'm guessing what, maybe four, five breakout rooms, Sarah? We've actually got a pretty big group, so I was going to go with seven. Okay, let's do that then. So you'll end up with doing some quick math, maybe four or five people in the breakout room. Just tinker. We're going to leave you over there for five minutes and tinker with the tools, talk with one another, chat, you know, whatever seems to make sense. There will be a timer that will pop up uh, giving you a countdown for when we will bring you back. So, um, well, dog on it. Sorry, I'm having a technical issue myself. <laughs> Sarah, I'm going to turn things over to you to um, go ahead and send us into breakout rooms, and we'll see you when you get back in four or five minutes. Okay, so I'm going to open all the breakout rooms. It's going to give you an option to join the room that you can click on to move to your breakout room. Sarah, would you stop sharing or stop the recording for a minute? Pause it. We don't just break out room one. They needed some help. Something happened when she went over there to help that, that she got booted out of our meeting and she was considered the host. So uh, she got back in, but she wasn't the host any longer. And there was no way because Jada, it, it reverted back to you being the host. It wasn't even me uh, that it reverted to. So we had no idea if we could actually get you all back in time. But it looks like it worked. So yeah. <laughs> I had set, sure. Zoom has a function where you can set a certain time for the breakouts, and then it will end on that time. And so thankfully, I had done that. So yeah, oh. welcome back. Yeah. All right. I want to talk just about a couple more things before we hang up today. Um, Dale talked about find your focus, be yourself only better. And I hope we were able to do that for you. Um, we are, as a company, offering free public webinars. And we just launched a new one called Leadership Communication in the Virtual World. Um, we're bringing together executive presence, your professional brand, and leadership communication. So we're doing these on Wednesdays and Thursdays, um, leadership communication on Wednesdays. So if you enjoyed this, spread the word. We're, we're happy to have whoever in in the zoom room with us so thank you so much for joining us today Jada and Marquita thank you for inviting us today and we're here to help so whatever you need from us go ahead and contact us and Sarah I don't know if you are able to now drop some information into um, into yes, uh, I'm about to post it okay perfect so link with us on LinkedIn give us a call whatever we're here to help so uh, Marquita did you have anything to say before we hang up today no, I just wanted to thank everybody for getting on the call today um, and a special thank you to you, Greg, Dale, and Sarah, and Turpin Communications for all that you're doing. Um, I always thank people for all that they're doing for the community, but thank you for all that you're doing for the nation. Um, <laughs> you are in Illinois, and I learned about you from something in Florida, and now you're in North Carolina, um, and it's what... Um, 
it's what these virtual cap this virtual um, stuff does. It makes us uh, makes the world a lot smaller and us a, a lot closer. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, to our audience, look out for a feedback survey and a link to this recording in the next 24 hours. There's a lot of great information covered and you can revisit this information via that, um, via a link to the video of this webinar um, at any time, which I plan on doing a little later because there's so much great content that was covered. Thank you all. And if that's it, we'll go ahead and end the call. Excellent. Well, thank you so thank much. You. Thanks everybody. Take care and stay safe. Thank you so much. You too. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Marquita or Jada, if one of you wants to end the recording, I don't have that.